I, at this time, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor Robert Full. He's a, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute or HHMI Professor of Integrative Biology here at Berkeley. He received his undergraduate master's and doctoral degrees at SUNY Buffalo and then held a postdoctoral position at the University of Chicago. He holds a joint appointment in electrical engineering and computer science and is a member of the graduate groups in biophysics and science and mathematics education in the Graduate School of Education. He's the founder and director of the Center of Interdisciplinary Bioinspiration in Education and Research, or CYBER, and is currently the editor in chief of the journal Bioinspiration and Biomimetics and serves on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicines Board of Life Sciences. He is a National Academy of Sciences mentor in the life science, sciences and elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, Professor Fool directs the Polypedal Laboratory, which studies the performance, energetics and dynamics of animal locomotion in many footed creatures. He has authored over 200 research contributions in animal motion science using diverse biological designs, such as cockroaches, lizards, and squirrels as natural experiments. These principles have resulted in the design of insect-inspired search and rescue robots, artificial muscles, novel control algorithms, and gecko-inspired self-cleaning dry adhesives. His outreach includes contributions to a national education challenge for children, development of museum exhibits, presentations of TED Talks, involvements in national and international science television programs, analyze the pitching motion of a Hall of Fame baseball player, and assisting computer animators making children's movies such as Bugs Life and Kung Fu Panda. Professor Lu Full leads a new HHMI-sponsored education program whose goal is to expand the STEM workforce with an early inspirational and interdisciplinary experience that fosters inclusive excellence showing diverse minds are required to invent the future. The topic of Professor Full's talk today is bio-inspired design, compressed cockroaches, gliding geckos, and smart squirrels. Um, I present uh, Professor Full. Oh, thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, introduction. Uh, and so I hope you find the bioinspired design uh, fascinating with these uh, incredibly cool creatures. But I really appreciate all of you uh, attending and really thank you for all your uh, service and, and interaction with the, uh, with, our, with the department and the university. Uh, that's me when I was younger and um, I liked really weird animals like crabs and cockroaches to dismay of my parents uh, who had to put up with them being dried out in our car as we drove home. And I was also very interested in motion. I wanted to be a major league baseball uh, player. That's me, number three, trying out for the uh, minor league Pittsburgh Pirates, the Niagara Falls Pirates. Well, I'm here. I didn't make it, but I did get to, when I went to Berkeley, uh, analyze an Oakland Athletics pitcher using the same motion analysis equipment that we did for animals. And so, as mentioned, I got all my degrees at the State University of America in Buffalo. That is Buffalo in the bottom right, uh, what it looks like often. Um, I didn't really know you could go to other places. I was a first generation uh, college student. So my parents didn't finish high school. Uh, but I got a great education with a great mentor. And then I went a little bit west to do a postdoc through Chicago. Uh, so less snow, but a little bit more wind. And this is my uh, 35th year at Cal. Uh, when I got to Cal, uh, it was uh, interesting in that I found out that uh, the famous zoology department that was there was gonna be replaced by a new department, the Department of Integrative Biology. And many thought that this was a mistake, uh, but our founding chair, Marvely Wake, uh, didn't. She could see a frontier where integration among a level of organization, diversity, and, and time will be required for the future. And boy, was she correct. Now uh, it's 
integration has occurred beyond the biological disciplines to a whole variety of other areas. This integration really and showcased how uh, nature offers a library of uh, design ideas. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, learning from nature and translating these principles is referred to as biomimetics. And biomimetics is really becoming the leading paradigm for development of new technologies that lead to significant scientific, societal, and economic uh, impact. Uh, if you look at the publication rate, uh, what you see is that it doubles every two to three years compared to most other fields, which is about a dozen years. And so I've been uh, uh, very fortunate to be a part of the founding of a journal in this called Bioinspiration from Biomedics in 2007 and the editor in chief uh, since 2013. And it's been so exciting to see all the new discoveries as they, as they come in in their translation. One particular area that's been uh, just extraordinary is a bio-inspired robotics. There's literally a zoo now of amazing robots out there. In fact, robotics was so game-changing, the AAAS created a new journal called Science Robotics. And in fact, Berkeley got the inaugural cover of my colleague, Ron Fearing, who uh, designed a, a bio-inspired hopping robot that I'll show at the, at the end. And I'm really fortunate to be on its scientific advisory board. And here at Berkeley, we, create, we created a center called Cyber, the Center for Interdisciplinary Biological Inspiration in Education and Research that really tries to integrate uh, education and research. And I, I hope I get a chance to talk about that a little bit at the, at the end. So what I'd like to do is show you four lessons we learned from nature and where they led. The first is we learned that animals are so good at managing energy effectively. So I work on these organisms. This is a cockroach running on a treadmill. Uh, there's a, 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 another species of a cockroach running on a treadmill. There's a scorpion with eight legs, a centipede running on a treadmill, and a eight-legged sideways running crab. Now, the obvious question is, why are you doing this? <laughs> and, and how do you get grant funding for doing this? Well, what we've learned is that diversity enables discovery by looking at organisms and, uh, and, uh, that are extraordinarily different. We find general principles. And let me show you one of those. So you might think locomotion or, or movement uh, on, on land is best done by a wheel. Isn't that sort of the, the perfect kind of uh, design for motion and what we found is almost all animals don't do that. They instead move like a bouncing ball, storing and returning energy. So here's one of those general principles. We discovered that two, four, six and eight legged animals all bounce along like this kangaroo, like a pogo stick storing and returning energy. So your one leg works like two legs of a trotting dog or three legs of an insect uh, working as one or four legs of a crab. Now, if you took that principle and you understood its design, could you translate that to build a robot? And so working with extraordinary engineers, we were able to do that. Uh, this is one of the first robots that could maneuver outside. Uh, it's Rex, a robot hexapod uh, that's from, uh, inspired from our uh, discoveries on uh, insect biomechanics. Here's the commercial version of it from Boston Dynamics um, going through an incredible difficult terrain uh, that uh, wheeled and tractor uh, vehicles uh, have a difficult, a difficult time. So you can really see what the advantage of uh, legs are for um, moving over uh, rough terrain. Uh, and of course, they couldn't maneuver this at all. Uh, and, and of course, they can't climb and do other things too. So legs have been really beneficial. We took racks to even rougher terrain, actually, uh, Capitol Hill, to show the benefits of uh, bio-inspired designs and to give you a hint of the kinds of uh, things that could do when it's translated. I'll show you uh, this uh, video uh, that addresses the possibility of using not only uh, a series of, of robots, 
but uh, also in conjunction with um, drones or flying robots for rapid response and detection or even retrieval of chemical, biological, and nuclear hazards. So here's Rex uh, going down into a subway uh, because there's uh, a, a, a hazard. Uh, and of course it doesn't have to pay because it's trying to save you. Uh, and it detects something and it could, there's now ones with arms on it. They could grab a sample, analyze it and actually bring it back in order to um, uh, let you know quickly uh, what it is. And so when it gets to the stairs, it actually knows with LIDAR, or a range finder, uh, what the steps are like, and it moves into a different gate. So there is going up the steps. Now, when we were studying the animals, we discovered that one species of cockroach, smear cockroach, runs really fast. And when it does it, it becomes bipedal. It runs on only two legs. So maybe this is like the first biped, I don't know. And so we turned to our amazing engineers and said, well, you know, can you make Rex do this too? And they did, they can make Rex bounce along uh, on, its, on its two legs, much like the, the, uh, the cockroach did. Uh, and then we could see how these principles of energy management that we discovered were really important also for restoring function. In addition, at this time, uh, we got a call from a studio, a movie studio, Pixar, and said, we saw that you have a paper on bugs running on two legs and you study bugs. Most. Can you help us make this children's movie? And so we had a chance to make uh, all the different uh, characters to help bring out their personalities in this, uh, in this children's movie. So a major point I wanna make and I'll do it several times, is that you never know where curiosity-based research will lead. The second lesson I'd like to talk about, so that one was on bio-inspired field robotics, it are uh, animals and their environment are inseparable. And so this will be talking about bio-inspired materials. Uh, Biomimetic functional material design has just exploded. It's really extraordinary, all the different capabilities, inspired by different uh, creatures. We were looking at attachment, not, not, of, uh, not of this uh, superhero, uh, but uh, this one. So this is the gecko gecko. Uh, and it's amazing how it sticks to things. So here's from a French uh, science television show and the gecko slipped down and is only holding on by one toe. And you can see it just you know, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's easy for it. If you look at the toes of geckos, what you see is they look kind of like alien feet. Uh, they have bizarre toes. We don't quite know why that is yet, but what we did find in looking at them is if you zoom in on their toes, you see they have these leaf-like structures called lamellae. If you zoom in on those, they have millions of tiny little hairs. And each hair kind of has the worst case of split ends possible, 100 to 1,000 split ends uh, that can contact a surface. And so these really tiny hairs, uh, we need to try, try to understand how they work. So I told my undergraduate at the time, uh, Tanya, that, uh, oh, you just need to go measure the force of a single hair. I was joking. Uh, she didn't realize it. And she was able to match the measurements we got from a very uh, a fancy Stanford uh, MEM sensor with a very simple wire. Uh, an ama amazing discovery of, the, of that. Uh, and she went on to be a professor at uh, Temple. So amazing undergraduate. And so what do we find? If you look at the, this uh, hierarchy of the gecko foot, uh, what we discovered is that it has 2 billion nano size split ends and they don't stick by, by suction or glue or interlocking or capillary action. They stick by intermolecular forces, by van der Waals forces. Now we wondered, you know, are all hairs the same? Fortunately, we have this extraordinary museum of vertebrate zoology that literally is a library of design ideas. And so one of my graduate students in PD went and started to look through all the feet and all the different hairs. And what she found is that they're incredibly diverse and we still don't know why. This would still be a good PhD project. But what we were able to do working with my colleague, Ron Fearing, is take the simplest version that only had one, one end, it's actually not even a, a gecko, 
And he was able to make the uh, first synthetic self-cleaning dry adhesive and begin a, a, new, uh, a new industry of fibrillar adhesion. So there's the artificial one on the right. And that's led to a, a spin-off company uh, by one of the postdocs in that paper called NanoGrip Tech and now is a subsidiary of another company that focuses on using this uh, wonderful adhesion, adhesive for wearables, sports, and medical um, devices. This is the first human supported by a gecko-inspired adhesive. Uh, it's, uh, there's Keller Autumn, uh, one of my uh, former PhD students, who's a professor at Lewis and Clark, and there's his firstborn child. Uh, and so she's uh, all geared up because the gecko sticks when you pull down, but it comes off when you, when you push it up to, 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 get, to get to detach. And so uh, she, she was uh, willing to do the, the first test. And if you look at the toes when they detach, it's crazy. They do this kind of peeling thing in milliseconds. And so could we take some of these ideas and, uh, and make a device, make a robot? And working with incredible colleagues at uh, Stanford, um, they made a robot called Sticky Pot. So it was the first robot that could move on uh, smooth surfaces. And what you see is that not only is it using that fibrillar adhesive, but they also decided that, you know, the peeling mechanism isn't too bad <laughs> for detachment. And so it very much looks like um, uh, a, a gecko climbing a wall. Who would have guessed that Tanya, who made that original discovery, would uh, come with me to brief the US uh, House of Representatives STEM Education Caucus on undergraduate research and American innovation? Uh, again, I say another example of you never know where curiosity-based research will lead. We just wondered about how they stick. Uh -huh. And then uh, my student, Ann Petey, said, you know, we're studying them upside down. And when they fall, they always land in the uh, sort of skydiving Superman posture. I said, how do they do that? And so we did that experiment, and we discovered that they have the world's fastest air writing response. And all they do is take their tail and swing it around and then go in this skydiving posture, which is amazing. And so we've discovered many uses for their tail. And we wondered, uh, since they do this, maybe they can glide, but they had no obvious gliding adaptation. So working with my colleague, Robert Dudley, we used his vertical wind tunnel, kind of what people do when they, uh, humans, when they practice skydiving, that blows air up. And what we discovered was, in fact, uh, these geckos can do equilibrium gliding, which is sort of, sort of amazing, even though they don't have these adaptations. And we take a picture of it, it's sort of breathtaking. You can see the uh, sticky toes, uh, but they also can glide. And then they can use their tail to turn left and turn right. So they had all this incredible capability, uh, but uh, no one ever saw them glide in nature. And so, uh, and so we published these gliding things, but we were concerned that <laughs> they really do this. So we sent a, a, a graduate student, who started as undergraduate, then a graduate student, already in Yusefi, to, to Singapore in Southeast Asia. This can you show that, in fact, they do this gliding. Uh, and he did. And so here's the first video of a glide. The red line shows the gecko. And if you look at the right, you'll see it hitting the tree and landing. Well, let me slow down the, uh, the uh, hitting the tree and, and landing. Uh, this is our latest publication uh, in uh, Nature Communications. Uh, watch what happens when it uh, goes into the tree. It's going at six meters per second and it crashes head first into the tree. And then it head over heels bends backward and is only saved by the force generated by its tail. We were able to make a soft robot actually do the same thing to understand this unique mechanism uh, to be able to uh, land on, on trees. Okay, so soft robots uh, are very robust. In fact, we really won't be able to use robots in interacting with humans in our home until they're, until they're soft robots. And this area 
uh, again, is the, the number of publications is just skyrocketing. It's one of the hottest areas, bio-inspired soft robotics. And so uh, here's our contribution to it. So we, if you look at an exoskeleton of, a, of an insect, of a cockroach, it does a lot of stuff, but really it's only skeletal plates and skeletal tubes that are attached with a compliant membrane between them. And so my colleague Ron Fearing in, in, uh, in, in ECS and engineering uh, developed an origami approach uh, that mimics the exoskeleton. So you have a flat sheet, you design it, you laser cut it, you laminate it, you fold it up, and you can get a robot. And here's the robot based on the biomechanics research on insects that we had. It's called DASH for Dynamic Autonomous Sprawled Hexapod. And it's incredibly robust, very much like the, like the animal. Um, and in fact, it's, it's so uh, robust that you have to be careful what you tell graduate students because they decided to throw it off uh, the top of Soda Hall and see if it would still function. Uh, and it does. And it turns out this, this team uh, of, uh, of, uh, of engineers decided that this might make a, a really exciting uh, toy. And so they had a startup called Dash Robotics. And so you can put this robot together uh, from a flat sheet and uh, drive it around. Kids really loved it. Uh, they collected some uh, funds uh, and eventually got a contract with Mattel to be able to sell the uh, the robots uh, for um, for education and and fun by kids. That kind of design led us to a question uh, that was posed by uh, my graduate student Kaushik Jaram, who said, "You know, these these designs of these bodies are so robust. How do they do it? How can they how can they go anywhere like this?" And so what he did was he did some uh, CT scans and showed that they can compress their body by 40%. So they can go through spaces as small as uh, two stacked uh, US pennies. And so here it is, this is kind of creepy. So there's the cockroach and it's gonna go, this is real time. And even though the standing height is 12 millimeters, uh, when it's standing there, it can squeeze through this tiny little space because it doesn't really have any hard parts. So it's able to do that. And then, uh, here are two confined spaces by two plates. And my students ask, well, uh, I wonder how it moves when it's in, it's in these vertically compressed spaces. I said, well, that, that's ridiculous. It can't move because it can't touch its feet. Uh, and that would be, you know, that'd be ridiculous to do. And they said, we already did it. I said, okay, uh, what did you find? And they found amazing things. So the top video is real time and then slowed down 20 times. You can't really see it real time, it's so fast. There's the animal and there it's slowed down as it's, as it's running. The next one is compressed a little bit and that's real time. And then you can see it's changing its gait a little bit. The bottom one is four millimeters. So you'll see real time and then it's followed by being slowed down 20 times. So ready, here's real time. So yes, it means that they can be squished in half uh, and run at high speeds in your walls, in your ceilings, in your floor. They are unbelievable. And so we wondered how they do this with their bodies. So we did materials testing on them. And so we looked at uh, force and, and compression. No cockroaches were hurt in this uh, experiment. We tested them running and flying before and after, uh, but they could withstand 800 times their body weight without injury. So it's just an extraordinary uh, design. So we took the approach uh, uh, of trying to do an origami version uh, of this robot. Uh, and uh, here's the uh, sort of overall design looking at the different uh, plates. And, uh, and Kaushik created uh, what we call Krom, crawling robot with articulated microstructures. Here's Krom. Uh, with a shell, and there it is compressed in half. So here's what it looks like when it's uh, running uncompressed. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like when it's, uh, when it's compressed. 
So it isn't touching its feet. It's actually using its legs, which partly what the spines are very effective for, and it allows it to move in confined spaces. So we envision such bio-inspired robots to have tremendous uh, impact on conservation, environmental monitoring, homeland security, structural inspection, search and rescue. Uh, and we're working with people like uh, uh, Robert Murphy, who has a center to look at urban search and rescue, uh, as well as uh, getting advice from, from, uh, from FEMA. Again, I think this is another example of uh, you never know where uh, curiosity-based research will lead. And so my final example uh, is uh, what we learned is, uh, from nature is that animals learn. Uh, and so we're looking at violence by learning, decisions, and creativity. Now, many of the robots that you see in videos are well-tuned to be successful at doing a particular behavior. But at the Opera Robotics Grand Challenge, when they didn't have a chance to tune things and they were uh, experiencing difficult uh, tasks, they had some problems. It's really hard to make uh, robots uh, do these kinds of things and be agile and make uh, uh, very effective uh, decisions uh, about, uh, about different tasks. So we turn to one of the smartest animals, uh, squirrels, uh, and to uh, develop a field we're calling cognitive biomechanics. Yes, they are the squirrels that are on campus. And fortunately, we have one of the world's experts uh, in psychology, Professor Husha Jacobs, uh, to help us. And we all know how incredibly agile uh, squirrels are. I mean, they can do amazing things. And we wondered, how do they know what their body can do? And how do they know what the environment can handle? Here's it being chased by a hawk. These are life and death decisions. How do they make those decisions? And so my PhD student, Nate Hunt, who's now a professor at the University of Nebraska, uh, looked at this. Uh, and uh, this was published a couple months ago in Science. So here's a, a graduate student, Judy Jin, who's the uh, great trainer. And we actually took the apparatus and we wheeled it outside behind LSA, or now Wildman. There's one that was trying to cut in line. They don't like that. And so, uh, so we uh, trained them to do uh, jumps uh, for a peanut reward. And you can see it's outside um, because you'll even see uh, some students that walking in the path back there. All right, one of the experiments we did was this one. We took uh, rods or simulated branches of three different stiffnesses and asked, how do they decide when to jump? How far along the rod should they go to get the peanut? And the, and the perch is very hard to land on. You, you, can, you can see this. And so what we reasoned was uh, if they jump right away, uh, it's a large gap, but it's pretty stiff, good footing. If they run down to the end, it's a, just a short jump, they can do it, but they're gonna be very compliant and it's gonna hard, hard, be difficult to be stable. So we hypothesized a trade-off between gap size and compliance. And sure enough, when we ran through all the squirrels uh, doing this and looked at their launch point decisions, animals selected shorter gap, gap distances on uh, stiffer branches and they selected longer ones uh, on very compliant which is sort of as we predicted, although they weighted uh, the stiffness more than the gap distance. And so we learned something about uh, their decision-making. Uh, next, we wanna understand better about their uh, learning. And so what we did is we had them jump off a very stiff platform and they did it well. And then we fooled them and took, made it look the same and made a very compliant uh, takeoff beam, uh, three times more uh, compliant. Uh, and so, um, so here's the first jump. It barely made it. Amazingly, out of 100, over 100 jumps, they never fell. By five jumps, plus or minus one, they were able to land perfectly on this very small perch. And so they're learning about body and space, 
uh, is uh, pretty extraordinary. And then we thought, okay, uh, experimenters, we're gonna now try a transfer learning experiment. We're gonna move the perch further back. We're gonna move it up. We're gonna see the ones who were able to do the other one, uh, if they could do better than the novices. And so we're, we have our high-speed camera shooting at it outside from the side, from the front, ready to do this experiment to see what they would do. And here's what they did. So they parkoured off the wall uh, very creatively and, and, and innovatively. And they looked at us when they landed on the perch like, you know, we're squirrels. I mean, we can sort of, you know, master <laughs> uh, any, any bird feeder. This is, a, this is no problem. So what, one of the things we're exploring is uh, what, under what circumstances uh, does uh, creativity occur? Uh, under what circumstances do they innovate? And we're finding very interesting results as it relates to uh, their biomechanics and their thought about what the environment uh, is like. Now, the question is, can we make then with this information uh, the most agile robot ever built? We have an amazing team of, uh, of uh, engineers uh, and material scientists uh, working on this uh, problem. And I'll show you some of the uh, robots uh, and, and the progress. So up, up in the left is one that's focusing on a backbone. Uh, at the bottom is one that's focusing on, on getting some of the jumping capabilities. And the one on the upper right is the one from uh, Ron Fearing's lab that was on the cover of, of Science Robotics. It's a monopod and it's focus on uh, hopping uh, effectively. And so I think they're all pretty, pretty amazing, but they're each a piece of trying to make robots that ultimately uh, can make decisions and learn and innovate. So again, we just never know where really incredible curiosity-based research will lead. Um, let me finish by showing how we can take this approach, this bio-inspired design approach, and leverage it for education to integrate teaching and research. And fortunately, I received support for uh, this from HHMI to develop a program I call Eyes Towards Tomorrow, Involve, Imagine, Innovate, Invent, and Innovate. And what it does is it combines discovery-based learning with design-based learning as Obama called for a nation of, of makers, where the real power of the revolution is in its democratizing effect, because almost anybody can then to be, can innovate. And we're finding that diversity is really demanded for innovation, that we think that the promise rests in uniquely diverse communities that engage in interdisciplinary approaches to solve societal problems that are, that are important, that are meaningful. And so to this end, I created a course called Bioinspired Design, uh, it's open to anybody. There are no uh, restrictions. And we have over uh, 40 different majors. We have uh, almost 200 students take it. And we're really fortunate because we have this amazing uh, design innovation institute, the Jacobs Institute, that allows students to design uh, with edited manufacturing, with printing and, and cutting electronics, amazing things, all in a wonderful building uh, that um, allows uh, interdisciplinary design related communities. And so here are, the here are some of the final projects from our bio-inspired design class, just to show you. Uh, here, this team invented a gecko-inspired tail for balancing uh, for the elderly, a spider-inspired sensing to restore touch and amputees, uh, muscle atrophy resistant casts based on the seahorse exoskeleton, uh, and uh, a group that looked at songbirds and developed a voice recovery system for throat cancer patients. So these are all amazing design ideas. Now we took that bioinspired design course that I just mentioned and decided to re uh, envision what a course should be. And in doing that, what we added were uh, student led classes or decal classes, you probably know them. And uh, and so we have a bio-inspired design uh, decal class and also a registered student organization. 
So this is student-led, student-created organization um, that's called the Berkeley Biodesign Community. And all of these then work together to form what we think of as a student-centered creative action community. Students want to make a difference and use what they learn. Very, we're very fortunate that the, the university has the, uh, a new program called Berkeley Discover and they offered a departmental innovation award to develop a discovery arc for, uh, for all students. Integrated biology got one and I'm, I'm so happy that we uh, were able to put together a proposal. Uh, we call it Discovery for All, Empowering Inclusive Communities and in Integ Integrated Biology. And so our hope is to integrate teaching and research from the future uh, because we know for the next generation of, of, of bio designers that diversity, diverse communities really hold the key to creativity and that each voice has a unique value as we uh, benefit from inclusive excellence. So that's my talk. Thank you and go Bears. Thank you, Bob. Um, that was very, very inspiring. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've read about some of this over the years, but putting it all together and seeing uh, examples is, is, is really amazing. Um, we have a few, a couple of questions. Um, the first is from your friend, Paul Licht, um, uh, and it relates to the geckos. And it says, what happens to writing ability if the tail is lost? Oh, very good question, Paul, because you, you've tried that, the ones that have lost their tail, and they can't write. So the tail is absolutely required for them to, to uh, do this mid-air mid -air writing. Okay. Um, <laughs> and the next question is from... Let me just say that, let me just say for everybody, it's on, it's, uh, that I'm at Berkeley in part because of Paul Licht, and I'm so grateful for him uh, initially when I came to be uh, one of the one of the mentors, and I, I can't I can't thank him enough for for everything he's he's done. Good. Um, the next question is from Ference Kobach, who a longtime member of the EECS staff. Uh, your work in integrative biology to EEC in integrating biology to EECS with Ron et al is a real stroke of genius. Thank you for agreeing to bridge the gap between bio and EECS. What is ahead of us and how can the alumni partake? Go Bears. So, um, so what's ahead is um, many, many of the areas that I mentioned are, are just starting to explode. So all of those are going to uh, benefit from uh, understanding biological principles because um, uh, as the natural, uh, technologies come closer to nature, then we can uh, invent, invent a lot more. And so that's only gonna speed up in so many, so many wonderful uh, different areas. Alumni could really help us uh, uh, in mentoring this um, new discovery-based curriculum that we put together. And so uh, we're moving to uh, course-based uh, research uh, but also uh, communities. And then there's another component actually of, of careers. Uh, and so we would love to have uh, volunteers of mentoring to be a part of this new uh, discovery initiative. It would be, it would be fantastic. Um, somebody asked, could you do this at a school with no graduate program, PUI or CC? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're doing that. We've disseminated it to five other uh, universities uh, and we're working with uh, Cal State Fresno uh, to develop this uh, bio-inspired program uh, there. And we also um, have uh, actually worked with the Lawrence Hall of Science and done it with high school students uh, in, summer, in a wonderful summer camp uh, with, with it. So um, although uh, the higher end design capabilities depend on the equipment, that's not required for the process. So when we bring in students, some of them are, are hesitant to work with the technology. We say, you have at least three options. You have crafts, 
which are fine to show the design ideas as a beginning prototype. You have uh, the ability to do drawings. Some people are interested in art or, or CAD programs. And then you can also do the, uh, the added manufacturing, the 3D printing and the laser cutting. So all of those are, are there. And, and so therefore you can use them you know, uh, at, uh, at, at, at any level. Uh, and so that's part of the push that we're working on is that it's really the process of understanding uh, how you extract fundamental principles and then translate them to a design idea. Um, kind of along that nature, um, Ellen Meltz Meltzer um, asked, uh, stated, I would imagine that very young children who have fewer barriers would have so many ideas in this area. Do you take your ideas to them? Yeah, so I actually, um, uh, I actually taught a sixth grade class <laughs> years ago with this kind of approach, and I was stunned at how creative they were. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of the reason why I, I showed you some of the, our undergraduates uh, too, that um, they come up with some of the, you know, the, the best ideas, just like you're saying, in part because uh, they don't know what can't be done. And it's a, it's a, so it's a competitive advantage to get people uh, that don't have fixed mindset, uh, that are willing to grow and, and to explore, uh, you know, the different areas that, uh, they can they can imagine, and so we really push that hard in our teams. We have forty teams in the Bioinspired Design course. We work hard at trying to understand effective teaming uh, and uh, active listening to try to make sure that every voice is is heard in the, in, in developing the the design ideas. We've actually done uh, so. We're working a formal assessment on this with the social scientists. Uh, as well as um, some pedagogical experts. And what we found is that we're uh, quantifying the creativity of these projects uh, with, a, with a, a matrix of, from the creativity literature, sort of a five by five matrix of, of different creati cre creativity criteria, uh, and people rate them independently. And what we've shown is that the more diverse the group is, uh, the more creative the projects are. So if you have more, a, more, a better mix of men and women, a better mix of the age of the student, a better mix of different majors, uh, the one they, they all have at least a few uh, advances, uh, significant differences in creativity. The one that the only one that has uh, them all is uh, when you have different ethnicities. So really different views of the world come up with incredibly creative. I, I ideas. And so we're really trying to explore how to develop uh, develop that more. Um, Pat, do you mind if I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I'm currently taking a class through Merritt College on butterflies and moths. And the teacher is the curator of the Essig Museum. So I was there over the weekend for the first time, which was really fun. So I'm curious if Butter, you know of any butterflies and moth experiments that have inspired bio-inspired design? So the, one of the biggest areas is structural color. So people have looked at the scales of, of butterflies and made amazing materials uh, that can reflect light different ways. In fact, they've, they've used these in part to create a novel displays. So it turns out Paul Jacob, Jacob's company, the guy who supported the Jacob's Design Innovation Institute, through Qualcomm made a, a display called the Mirasol display, which is based on the reflection in butterfly scales. He made a, a micro uh, mechanical, micro electric mechanical system version of it with incredibly bright colors. Uh, and so, so yeah, absolutely. That's one of the, that's one of the, uh, the hot areas. Also people are looking at uh, super agile uh, flying uh, robots by trying to understand the, 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 uh, the butterflies have very unusual uh, uh, wing patterns and, and wing beats. And so people are trying to understand uh, what, that, what that does in, in, in flight. But uh, I, I would say structural color is the hottest area. Um, Paul, Paul had a comment. Um, 
Bob, you still have a lot to learn, but really good start. Great talk. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how he means that. <laughs> oh, I know how he means that. And he means that. Because <laughs> that's quintessential Paul. And I, and I miss it. I miss <laughs> it. <laughs> so, so Ference came back and said, how can I help get East Bay High School students involved? Robotics, tech club, coding, Girl Scout clubs, and or involved at the high school levels. Any suggestions? Yeah, so I, I think that we've we've done it uh, with the help of the Lawrence Hall of Science. They're amazing. I mean, people think that they're some kind of muse science museum. They are, but they are a force in education. They are one of the nation's best at uh, at education research and and development. And so. I would say, you know, let's let's talk and uh, and uh, see if uh, we can work out like we did for the, the summer camp some some programs. Likewise, many of the um, the, the registered student organizations uh, at uh, Jacobs uh, interact with high school students, and so there's 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 about thirty of them that are in that Design Innovation Institute. Uh, that if you um, put together you know, who's interested and what they're interested in, we can give them uh, a list and they can make, make connections. They're always looking for uh, outreach and, 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 uh, and, and different opportunities. Uh, so uh, that's actually also a part of this whole revolution of uh, the, the uh, Berkeley Discovery uh, Award uh, is, to, is, to, is to reach out and do uh, uh, education and, and, and public service. Um, Carrie was mentioning before uh, your talk started about um, the Emeriti Academy, which is uh, fairly uh, new on campus, and that they're going to start reaching out uh, uh, to the Discovery, people who've been gotten the Discovery Award. So for all you Emeriti out there who might want to get involved in, in some way, check in with the Emeriti Academy um, to, to to interact and see what they're doing in terms of mentoring students and working. Yeah. With oh, please, program. because that you know that's uh, obviously there's so many studies showing now that mentoring is is just critical and it's mentoring at every level. You know, it's peer mentoring and and and, and to have uh, the incredible wisdom of the uh, uh, Meritai and, and it, it would just be uh, it'd just be wonderful to uh, to hear from you. So we we. We plan to build that in to the structure that we have. That's part of the grant that we wrote. Great. Um, I don't see any more questions. A couple of comments. This was terrific. Thanks so much. Um, so, um, any other questions coming through? Well, if not, I want to thank Bob for uh, his time uh, and interesting topic. Um, you know, I can't see, I can't, I can't wait to see where all this is leading uh, in the future. Um, is, as you said, it's just moving at such a great pace um, compared to other research. I mean, research, you know, you know, after, after working at the university for 34 years and just seeing how things have moved, um, you know, in the 80s, trying to figure out what inter interdisciplinary meant. And now if you don't have interdisciplinary, um, you're not going to get very far. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you who tuned in today. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it.